Of all the compatibles man has discovered in the world of food and drink, none excels the harmony with which mint blends into a silver goblet filled with ice, a dusting of sugar, and several ounces of mellow bourbon. The mint julep symbolizes the tradition of hospitality and domestic joy. Its gentle sway has produced a lore that is vast, intricate, and controversial. The word julep goes back about 500 years. Milton wrote of this cordial julep here that flames and dances in his crystal bounds with spirits of balm and fragrant syrups mixed. The diarist Pepys proceeded on June 22, 1660, thence to my lords and had the great walk to Brigham's who gave me a case of good julep. But the julep made by our fragrant native mint is our own American invention. The introduction of sprigs of bruised, muddled, or virginal mint probably occurred in Virginia. As early as the year the Constitution was adopted, Virginians took their eye-opener in a silver goblet at breakfast, made with brandy or rum. The volunteers who fought the Mexicans departed for the seat of war with the aid of the julep bucket. Hard rock miners on the California loads took the mint julep with them and saw the elephant and other strange beasties if they sipped too many chalices powered with three or four ounces of 100-proof whiskey. The great Confederate raider General John H. Morgan lifted the frosted glass in the Richmond Café called Congress Hall. Johnny Solon, gifted weaver of symphonic compositions in alcohol, who came to the Waldorf Bar soon after the Spanish-American War and stayed to help close it up in 1920, made a specialty of the mint julep as an ornamental and ceremonial drink for great occasions. It took Solon 30 minutes to erect the edifice of a julep, the rim of the glass icy with polar cold, the frost a good half-inch thick, the commingling of scents and flavors said to have combined the perfumes of Araby with the nectar of Olympus. But it is not with Richmond or New York or the High Sierras that this great ritualistic drink is peculiarly associated. The mint julep belongs to Kentucky and to bourbon. In the bluegrass state, it is as sacred as Derby Day or the memory of Henry Clay. When the shadows of afternoon begin to lengthen and there is a pause in the day's affairs, from deep within the interior of the house comes the musical tinkle of cracked ice and glassware. Shaky old Grandpa settles himself in the shady corner of the veranda while George builds the mint julep and, with a final flourish, thrusts into the beaten coin cup a few sprigs of the dark green pointed leaves which the colonel's little granddaughter gathered on the sheltered side of the old spring house. If Grandpa uses the recipe of the Pendennis Club in Louisville, there are five or seven leaves of mint, and they are not crushed. Other schools of thought, also backed by impressive authority, call explicitly for bruising the greenery. Considerable heat can be generated over this question of whether to crush or not to crush but it is as nothing compared to the distress which a Kentuckian feels when he contemplates the use of alien liquors, as he regards them, in a mint julep. This is the issue which estranges and embitters. A proper julep must be made with bourbon whiskey. Marylanders crush, and they also pour in rye whiskey. Colonel Irvin S. Cobb, a man who had a cigar, a bridge, and a mint julep named after him, felt constrained to say of his good friend H. L. Mencken, the Baltimore nester and critic of life and manners, Any guy who'd put rye in a mint julep and crush the leaves would put scorpions in a baby's bed. Variants on the basic mint julep have been reported from West Virginia and deep in Mississippi. But Kentuckians, who were awarding silver julep cups as prizes at county fairs as long ago as 1816, scoff at the pretensions of usurpers. As Lawrence S. Thompson, who is a scholar and a Kentucky gentleman, puts it, Pretenders and upstarts, 
even remote Louisiana, knavish Georgians, have attempted to produce the very dream of drinks from corn whiskey sweetened with molasses, and he goes on to assert flatly, but there is one bona fide mint julep. It is indigenous to the bluegrass. The most lyric tribute ever penned by the encomiasts of the mint julep comes from the files of the Lexington Herald. A jeu d'esprit of the Lexington attorney Judge Sol Smith, 1848-1904, Smith's recipe and panegyric is one of the great set-pieces of Southern eloquence, wit, and humor. It goes like this. Then comes the zenith of man's pleasure. Then comes the julep, the mint julep. Who has not tasted one has lived in vain. The honey of Hymettus brought no such solace to the soul. The nectar of the gods is tame beside it. It is the very dream of drinks, the vision of sweet quaffings. The bourbon and the mint are lovers. In the same land they live, on the same food are fostered. The mint dips its infant leaf into the same stream that makes bourbon what it is. The corn grows in the level lands through which small streams meander. By the brookside the mint grows. As the little wavelets pass, they glide up to kiss the feet of the growing mint. The mint bends to salute them. Gracious and kind it is, living only for the sake of others. The crushing of it only makes its sweetness more apparent. Like a woman's heart, it gives its sweetest aroma when bruised. Among the first to greet the spring it comes. Beside the gurgling brooks that make music in the pasture, it lives and thrives. When the bluegrass begins to shoot its gentle sprays toward the sun, mint comes and its sweetest soul drinks at the crystal brook. It is virgin, then, but soon it must be married to old bourbon. His great heart, his warmth of temperament, and that affinity which no one understands, demand the wedding. How shall it be? Take from the cold spring some water, pure as angels are. Mix it with sugar till it seems like oil. Then take a glass and crush your mint within it with a spoon. Crush it around the borders of the glass and leave no place untouched. Then throw the mint away. It is a sacrifice. Fill with cracked ice the glass, pour in the quantity of bourbon which you want. It trickles slowly through the ice. Let it have time to cool. Then pour your sugared water over it. No spoon is needed, no stirring is allowed. Just let it stand a moment. Then around the brim place sprigs of mint, so that the one who drinks may find a taste and odor at one draft. When it is made, sip it slowly. August suns are shining. The breath of the south wind is upon you. It is fragrant, cold, and sweet. It is seductive. No maiden's kiss is tenderer or more refreshing. No maiden's touch could be more passionate. Sip it and dream. You cannot dream amiss. Sip it and dream. It is a dream itself. No other land can give so sweet a solace for your cares. No other liquor soothes you so in melancholy days. Sip it and say there is no solace for the soul, no tonic for the body like old bourbon. A variation upon this reverent and poetic approach to the mint julep was suggested by Mars Henry Watterson. Pluck the mint gently from its bed, just as the dew of the evening is about to form on it. Select the choicer springs only, but do not rinse them. Prepare the simple syrup and measure out a half tumbler of whiskey. Pour the whiskey into a well-frosted silver cup, throw the other ingredients away, and drink the whiskey. Whatever the recipe, he who sips wisely takes his time to appreciate the minutia of flavor and meditate upon the meaning of life and the lovely mysteries of the corn spirit, of the char and the oak barrel, will find by the time he can see the sugar in the bottom of the glass that there is a balm in Gilead. 